Welcome back, everybody. Today we're discussing Shogun Episode 5. The episode begins with the army of Toranaga shaking the earth. They finally make it back to Ajiro in the wake of Josen being slaughtered, and alongside him is the war-torn Buntaro. Mirko is shocked, and behind her is the man that she just slept with. The tension swells as we try to figure out what exactly that means in a culture this strict and worrying that the single moment of humans being humans may lead to a terrible outcome for the characters that we enjoy. It also makes us immediately question how he was able to escape. The last time we saw him, he was facing a horde set to dispatch him without mercy. He is a talented fighter, but he is surely lost in this battle, in this moment. Escape was unlikely, but now we have to determine if it was impossible or not. Knowing how backhanded this fighting has been and how layered the conflict is and how assassiny it really has been it's entirely possible that he didn't make it out and a necromancer is controlling him i'm just kidding it's entirely possible that he is a spy spared only so that he could betray Tsuranaga when the time is right this entire episode feels like his behavior is being highlighted to make us question if this man that we really don't know outside of being a dick is acting normal or not like, we don't have a baseline for who he is yet. The start of the episode is quite brief, but it does an incredible job of setting the stage for what's to come. Episode 5 is currently my favorite, and I have not watched Episode 6, which just came out a couple days ago. I'm still trying to catch up on these reviews. Sorry, guys. We then see Oshiba in transit and the regents discussing Toranaga. Once the Mother of the Air finally returns, they will impeach Toranaga. But Lord Ishido reminds them that they cannot just impeach without a fifth regent being appointed. Each of them offers people that would benefit their own cause, highlighting perfectly how corrupt this organization has become. Nobody is able to be objective and make a choice that would benefit the Tycho's heir. It's all about their power struggle, and the pretending to be advisors for anything aside from their own growth is growing thin. Mariko and Toranaga go hunting with the Lady of Steel, which is his falcon. It is the first time that she's gone hunting, and it's nice that they're sharing this moment together. I'm not sure exactly the significance of it, but it does seem like he trusts her, or at least he wants her to feel like she is trusted, because we know that his true heart is always kind of hidden. They talk about the great escape of Buntaro and the contingent of Ronin that made it happen. Hired soldiers helped him escape. By the end of his journey, only two of them remained. It is a line that is meant to show he wasn't captured, nor did he get out easily. He truly fought till the bitter end, and just when it felt like it was once again hopeless, he finally made it to Edo. However, Ronin are hired soldiers, so it kind of begs the question, who hired them? We know that there's a base in Macau that is the Christian base, that is the Operation Secret Center. It has been amassing soldiers, Ronin specifically, so one of the Christian lords hiring these men to help him escape and maybe sell the fact that he didn't actually take a deal for his life is possible. I don't know how that conversation looks if truly Buntero is the only one that made his escape happen and he got hired help along the way. It was just like he was running for his life and passed a Ronin bar and offered them something of value to an entire troop of Ronin. I, I just don't know what it is. What could he have offered? Like, how did he actually make it out with the help of hired soldiers? This feels like perhaps I just don't understand the system or maybe I understand the ship perfectly and something fishy is happening in his story. Um, honestly, it could also be that I'm just trying to poke holes because my confirmation bias is acting up here. I... Oh, man, there's something fishy happening. I don't know what it is, though. I think I want this character to have some kind of depth behind mean husbands who, like, has a kind of weird backstory. Uh, so maybe I'm reaching here, but I've, I've died on smaller hills, so <laughs> let's get it. Mariko gives Tornaga a journal containing all that John has done since he left, and then orders Mariko to stay with John and make room for her husband to join the household as well. This could be highlighting a desire to keep Buntero in a gilded cage, much like John is. He decides to keep this man who, on the surface, just became a war hero with a legacy of a god king, confined to a house with another man. And I really think there's, there's a reason why that happens. Nagakado pops up and he gets ignored. Instead, they talk about whether or not it was his idea to kill Josen. Nagakado approaches and they decide to give the pheasant to John as a gift, a seemingly wonderful token of appreciation that could not go wrong in any possible way. 
You can tell Toronaga is holding himself back in the scene. He barely looks or acknowledges his son until Mariko is out of sight, and he must. Nagakato starts the conversation, and Toronaga immediately jumps to this action being flamed or encouraged by Yabushigi or Omi. It is honestly, I'm quite amazed that he that he knew this quick. But, you know, he's that dude. Toronaga lets some of his hidden behind an eightfold fence slip out, and the animals buck back and flutter because of it. He knows that he fell for a trap, and his son has created the conditions that kind of benefit his enemies, which he then kind of spins in his advantage later on. He says that all men are falcons. Some kill anything that moves, and others are lazy and only go after the bait. It is all about learning how to fly them how you please, and then they will do the hunting for you. It's another conversation, just like the first time we ever saw either of these characters, where I am sure that Toranaga is begging for his son to listen and hear what he is actually saying in that metaphor. He strips the command from Nagakato, and we return to Lord Ishido about to find out what happened to Josen. He says very little, but the implication is clear. This certainly does mean war. John gets this gift of a pheasant, and he enjoys this greatly. He talks in words that they can't understand, and his enjoyment is quite clear, though when he hangs the bird, Fuji realizes that it's going to rot, and nobody really knows what he's after and trying to do. He does this anyway, wanting to share a custom with, with his new friends. And this is once believed to be a way of making the meat better in some very subjective way that probably has like little merit. Maybe the taste, maybe the tenderness. It is nonsense, but it is, you know, a part of the past. They accept his conditions. Move the bird and you die. It is a very quick line that meant very little to nothing to him. It was a joke or maybe even a, a like, like a much harsher version of a word that he actually meant. But... As someone who has sworn my life and limb to murder my partner if she ever wakes me up tickling my feet again, I get it, bro. Like, the Japanese here, much like anybody else that was offended by that joke, just don't get it. And now that we're on the topic of healthy living situations, in comes Buntaro. Fuji is his niece, and he does not seem happy to be where he is. Fuji assures that they will take care of everything that he needs, and then very politely reminds him that he is not a consort to a barbarian. She is a consort to a Hatamoto, making sure that he knows John deserves some respect here, making sure, most importantly, that he gets respect in his own home. Buntaro asks some rather pressing questions and then kind of gets a little racist here before leaving to go somewhere that I don't think that we ever really find out about. He says that he's going to be back for dinner, and then he dips, and we don't see him until dinner. We return to Toranaga and Yabushigi. He reports on this new regiment that was trained, and Toranaga then asks directly about the offer that Yabushigi was given to return to Osaka and swear his allegiance to the council. He scrambles to say no in front of his lord that has all of the power that he could possibly want, and ultimately just wanting to make sure that he stays on Toranaga's good side, now that Josen has been killed, and they must fully believe that he has betrayed Lord Ishido. Yabushigi brings up being bound by fate after they watched the sunrise together and probably again held hands. It's a funny line, and maybe even a little gay if my fan fiction ever does go mainstream, but it kind of shows us that he is grasping at straws here. Toranaga, straight to the point in these moments, is asking if it wasn't him who convinced Nagakato to do the hit. And then he says that Yabushigi, directly, is playing both sides. And then he affirms that it is actually his nephew, Omi. They talked, they got drunk, and perhaps this is how everything happened. He was very quick to blame. And like the 6D chess master... Tsukuranaga was ready to flip the script as soon as Yabushigi suggested that he would discipline his eager nephew. Instead, he rewards him for creating the conditions in which his opposing armies would have to leave their stronghold and come into their domain. He also gives Omi command over the new regiment that they just trained. It is a beautiful play. Like, this regiment is ultimately responsible for Josen's death, and this assures Omi is now feeling empowered to lead this regiment and continue to fight for Toranaga's cause. Now that they have very little way to actually betray him, he will have to fight much like he would if he was a sworn ally, because it's a fight to survive either way. 
We then see Omi and Yabushigi ripping apart people's homes. They search for any trace of a spy, the spy that ultimately led Toranaga to having more information than he should have had. But they don't have any kind of luck. Omi offers to give control of the regiment over to his uncle, and Yabushigi takes this as an insult. A right away takes this as an insult. His pride makes him react this way, wanting to hold power over somebody else's head after he had to backtrack in front of his lord, who he probably doesn't even respect. It's showing his true heart, much like the rotting bird that is starting to cause trouble. We then get this awesome conversation between Fuji and Mariko, and it starts with Fuji assuring herself that they are, they're cursed, right? Citing the rotten bird that perfumes their home and the dead husband that has just returned from being dead. She then gets a little more serious, asking Mariko if she would tell her if she thought John was in danger. This because it's her responsibility to look after him and his home, and to me, this feels like a subtle way of telling us that maybe Fuji knows about her and John's cloudy, rainy night the other night. It ends in a way that really does make it seem like Mariko does not think that Fuji knows, and later when we learn about the swords and the lies that really shape Fuji's existence, it feels like all of them think that she is a simple girl. And I think that that could be because she is, or, more likely, they just want us to believe that. Like, perhaps Fuji knows so much more than people give her credit for, and is capable of so much more than people give her credit for, which is probably where this is heading, but I'm not too sure. John asks about Buntaro staying with them, also wondering if he is in danger. Mariko asks that he be a gracious host, and really just wants him to keep his mouth shut and honor her husband. John is then dressed and talks to the gardener. He replies in Japanese, and then speaks to Buntaro in Japanese as well. It's showing the growth over the training regiment passage of time without showing necessarily a montage of him learning this explicitly. Buntaro corrects him, asking to be called by an official title instead of a name reserved for his friends. It starts this feeling that the night is not truly going to be pleasant or what either of them actually want. Dinner is then served, and we see the meal that John has made with his entire heart. The reactions said everything we needed to know about the smell that this dish caused. They refused to eat the rotten food he prepared, and then Buntaro comments about John's eating. This pissing contest was absolutely perfect, and starting it with this cultural quirk about slurping noodles is just the best way to do it. I can't tell you how many times I've been told that slurping noodles like an absolute madman is just the way to show your enjoyment or appreciation for the food you're eating. I'm not from a slurping culture, and every time I've tried it, it just, it kind of feels bad. I just, I feel awkward doing it. Perhaps if I'm ever in Japan and the standard is set by the other patrons at the shop that I'm eating at, I'm there. I'll do it. That sounds great. But, I'm not loudly slurping my noodles at Ramen Tatsuya because a colleague told me slurping is a compliment. That's why I tip. Well, that's not why I tip. I tip because I can't click no after the person who took my order got my name wrong and turned around a large white screen bright enough for six other people behind me to determine if I was a, a good person supporting the working class or not. That is why we tip in my culture. We've been convinced that we pay extra to support workers directly instead of assuming their billion dollar conglomerates are able to pay their employees livable wages. But that is a different story. That's a different video for a different time. I really just want my older brother to stop slurping like an absolute fucking unit whenever I'm trying to enjoy my noodles. But back in Shogun, we see John slurping louder than trying to mirror Buntaro, then drinking more and poking fun at his dainty little cup that is for women. I loved Mariko translating here. Her keeping the peace and framing each other's brutish ways in a way that wouldn't be offensive to the other is just so real. Oh my god, this was so good. Buntaro takes the bait, fully prepared to outdrink the oaf in front of him, and the girls, clearly uncomfortable with the path that alcohol leads in these moments, is kind of preparing for what's to come, trading glances and worrying about how this is actually going to unfold in the worst way possible. Finally, Mariko tries to wrap things up, and John pushes for a story about his escape from Osaka. It is a topic that is quite sensitive, and Buntaro does not want to share it. This further adds to the suspense about if he truly did escape on his own, or if another lord helped him and he is going to betray Toranaga. Fuji apologizes for John, like asking about the story being somehow forbidden. It is 
I guess it's similar to asking soldiers about their exploits when they return from war, but I really didn't understand why he wouldn't want to talk about what was clearly the greatest escape. Would I ever shut up about this? I don't know. This moment kind of shifts the attitude, and Bonsero wants him to boast about his own battle stories instead. Mariko breaks the politeness and demands that he tells a story and quietly begs him to not aggravate her husband. John says no and demands that his request be fulfilled. Bunsero starts yelling. His men bring him a bow and arrows and demands that John picks a post at the end of the driveway, at the, at the entrance of his home. This pissing contest is suddenly violent, and Buntero showcases his household abuse. He launches two arrows past her face, something that must have occurred before as she is remaining perfectly still and hoping that she is not shot in the head by her drunken husband. It is terrifying, and John demands that while women are also property in London, Mariko should not be treated in this way. It's him overstepping a boundary, even if it is one that deserves to be overstepped, and Mariko translates, knowing that her husband would be unhappy with what was just said. It is a very clear moment of defiance and letting that eightfold fence down just a tiny bit, and I love to see it. In this strict and hard-to-please culture geared towards men, this is her jumping at the opportunity to say her true feelings through the mask of just simply translating what somebody else has said. She has been polishing each of their words, making sure that nothing was offensive, but she stops, wanting her husband to know that she should not be treated like this. The scene, the depth that comes with it is just incredible. The writing, the acting, the moment that felt like it, someone could breathe wrong and it would be an all-out brawl. Few things ever create magic like this, and I loved this moment. Buntero laughs at the idea and then demands that she tells John about her family, the absolutely disgusting filth that she comes from. John tries a few times through this, you know, to tell her that she can just lie to him. She doesn't need to reveal anything to him that she does not want to. But the truth is, she does. She wants John to see her, the fool her, not just the woman in front of her like they talked about while John was bathing, but everything that makes her her. She is the daughter of an assassin that killed the corrupt leader before the late Tycho named Corrida. Hearing that she was the daughter of an assassin with this vague subplot of assassins going on in the background really makes me think that she could be reliving her father's life in some in some more meaningful way, right? In more ways than just one. And perhaps the conversation with Toranaga about continuing her father's battle could mean more than just helping her translate for this English pilot. She says that her family was hunted because of what her father did. Her father was forced to execute all of his children and his wife, everybody except for Mariko, before committing Sempuku. She was spared because she was married. Every single year since her father has died, on her anniversary, she asks for a single thing, and that is that she be permitted to take her own life, feeling that her being alive while they are not is an injustice. It is heartbreaking, and it makes me feel some rather mixed emotions about, about Bontaro. I could not imagine what life would be like with someone who begged me every single year to let her kill herself. It is, oh my God, what is that like? I, like, it would be hard to be around that, right? Him shooting arrows past her head is kind of also more interesting now. Maybe when she closes her eyes, she hopes that this is the time. And I, I really, that is just so tragic. John hears the story. Buntero yells at Mariko and the scene ends. Some amount of time goes by. They go to bed and John wakes up to Mariko being beaten. He grabs his pistols, charges forward to save the girl, and meets Fuji. She begs him not to engage, but he must. John finds Mariko crying and hurt, sitting on the floor and upset that Buntero saw something of hers. I'm assuming it's the journals about John, but they don't show it. Um, the moment here, also great A. Mariko, until this point, has rarely let herself be shown in anything but a proper light. She yells at them to get out, and then after not being heard, shouts at the top of her lungs to leave. This moment, you can tell, she is broken, snapping at people she doesn't actually want to, but that raw emotion is coming out from behind the eightfold fence, and it is being felt. Fuji 
tears in her eyes, demands that she must not disturb this home. Otherwise, it is a dishonor to John himself. This is showing that Fuji doesn't know how to react here. She is doing the thing that she knows and demanding that the rules be followed, not able to like offer any compassion to her hurt friend that's crying in front of her. The crying, this internal struggle in Fuji is, is showing the internal battle. She doesn't want to say these things. She is scared. She doesn't know what to do. So what can she do? Mariko replies that there is nothing that she can dishonor, laughing at the idea. The cursed home is all that they are trapped inside of. And John marches into the darkness, shouting for Buntaro. They stop and stare at each other. The moment is just so tense, and John wanted to fight to defend her honor. And Buntaro, also compelled by honor, bows before the man as humbly as he can, acknowledging that he just dishonored his home. John goes furious after Buntaro says sake, trying to explain with their limited language that like what happened, why he dishonored the home. The tension ends when John finally steps away and we get this shot of Buntero feeling something, maybe about what he just saw, maybe about his plot in general. He is going through it. His eightfold fence is cracking and I really cannot wait to learn what is on his mind. John passes the fence post, showing just how incredible of an archer and athlete and fighter that Buntero is. The scene is rather odd, and I think it's been included to highlight just how easy of a fight this would have been if Buntero had actually wanted to get into a fight. That the often backwards honor system is the only thing that kept John from really getting his ass kicked or things escalating further than than it was when these you know when men when giant fucking beasts are at each other's throats and and conflicting interests are fucking conflicting. Maybe it's kind of maybe this point is to highlight the the use cases of the honor system that try to like, I don't know, create a web that's above this like primal nature that demands that we fucking choke each other out sometime. You know, it's like sometimes you just got to take the L. You just got to bow your head. Even if you are the stronger person, the faster person, the better person, you just you must follow the rules. You must honor the fucking people around you sometimes. And I think that's ultimately why this shot was included, even though it's really not too... It's not too crystal clear. It's just kind of showing that he's a good shot, right? But I think that like what I just provided is maybe the depth behind why we're being shown that shot. Um, we then see this man talking to Torinaga, providing all of the proof that we need to affirm his spy status. The birds being by the water also makes me wonder if this is where he was coming from when he first discovered the boat in episode one. They discuss Yabushigi hunting for a spy, and the man is just immediately ready to give his life to stop the search and, and make sure that everything's okay, likely because Toronaga has other spies or that Toronaga would be discovered himself spying, even though, like, they know. It ultimately is just saying that he wants to protect them. Toronaga says that he is too valuable and a long-serving samurai named Tono Mato. Toranaga says that they need to find a way to stop the search by finding another spy, which then brings us back to the pheasants and the village spreading rumors about the residents being haunted. John does not listen to Fuji, instead goes rushing to find Mariko and discovers her by a mountainside watching the water. He tells her to be done with her abusive ass husband, to go get that black card, to go treat yourself, and honestly I agree, but she just cannot believe that he does not understand how things work and how impossible that actually is. She brings up the swords that he carries, said to belong to Fuji's father, and how him, a Hatamoto, having them, now honored her family. In reality, they were bought from a drunken man for three bags of rice, and her father died begging for his life. A few know the secret, but they keep it from Fuji because Fuji knowing it could only hurt her. And their silence gives the swords meaning, gives them purpose, gives them power. And she will not give the same to Bantaro. She will remain silent and give him nothing. That is how she will fight back. John calls bullshit, telling her that it's a nice sentiment, but silence is not a way to prevent your abuser from abusing you. He says that just like him, she is her own person and, and does not need to create these boxes to live in. She does not need to live for her father or live in anguish because of her husband. She must figure out how to live for herself and what she actually wants, which, of course, is not the point of this story. This isn't about the self-centered Western thinking. It's about being a part of a larger story. It's about a culture that is atypical to his and how he 
thinks. She says that if freedom is all that he is living for, then he will never be free of himself. It's not about the pursuit of happiness. It's about figuring out how to be happy where you are, not feeling like you're constantly chasing something because that is the thing that traps you in a life of wanting more or being unhappy with your present. It is, it is a sentiment that John contemplates and probably probably does not understand by the end of this episode. Trying to understand her perspective sincerely is very hard, and it brings us to a saddened village. The tears preparing us for the news of the gardener. Fuji tells him that the bird was taken down, and John is rather unbothered. To him, it was just a bird, a dinner that did not work as he hoped, and the gardener taking it down was probably the right call. That's when Fuji tells him that he gave his life to take down the bird that was smelling up the village. Let me tell you, I was shook when this scene happened. Oh my god. He did so because it was a service to the house and all around him and it accepted that moving the bird meant death. John could just not believe this. To him, this is the most ridiculous thing you could ever give your life for. And he spends the rest of the episode and maybe the rest of his life contemplating that action. Fuji offers him her life, which again just bewilders John. How could these people be so willing to end their lives when having a life is just the basis for everything else that you could experience, all the joy, all the good, everything that comes after this moment? This episode really has like a blunt check to show us this Western thinking being exposed to Eastern ideology at a time in where history is just drastically different for these two people. This entire show is marvelous at highlighting how the conditions of our environment shape who we are, making us consider how this culture in feudal Japan came to be through the lens of someone who is really trying to understand it in the most hands-on way possible. It is, again, it's great. The show is so good. But he backs away and starts yelling for them to leave. And then that brings us to Toranaga. John says that it is time for him to go. He trained Toranaga's men and should be rewarded with a ship and his men to go back home. And Toranaga can see that something is going on between these two. And Mariko lies to John, saying that he is only curious about what makes John upset. He brings up the pointless rituals and this lack of mercy or understanding about how precious life actually is. He brings up his gardener, and Toranaga tells him to stop acting like a child. And then Mariko educates him about his words giving the bird meaning, that his command made the bird a totem of importance and the extension of himself and his story. Even though he didn't care about this bird at all, the act of going against his wishes was the act. We learn that the gardener was sick, and someone told me at some point in the book the gardener was actually dying, so I think it's also safe to assume that a similar path was happening here though I don't think that's actually said in this episode. John tries to come to terms with his actions about killing the old man with his words, essentially. And again, we have this beautiful saying, we live, we die, and we control nothing beyond that, which is when these birds fly into the air and the ground shakes again, just like the start of the episode. Another earthquake that moved the mighty land like it was nothing. Toranaga is swept under, and John is the first to go after him. After a tense moment of what-ifs, they uncover Toranaga. His first breaths back are so harsh it felt like you could hear the dirt leaving his lungs. He looks at John like a saint and knows in this moment who would protect him. They are all relieved, but his swords are nowhere to be found, which then gives John the best chance to understand how his words are giving things meaning. These swords, which were bought from a drunken man for three bags of rice, coveted by only those that don't know the truth, will now become the blades that a Minawara takes into battle and uses to lead his great army to a resounding victory over his enemies. Assuming the story is what makes these swords so great and what will make his children and their children honor these blades that ultimately were just bought for for rice. And John is now part of the story about how a great man retook his country from invaders trying to steal it from them. This entire thought is really just trying to highlight how important it is to be a part of the grander story. It's not about being the, the fisherman, about the tiny little pieces in your own story that live and die with very brief lives in a volatile environment. It is about creating a narrative together. It is about Toranaga's story being so grand that even drunken sores and that moment that meant nothing so long ago 
and lead and spiral and all add to this grand thing about a great leader coming to power and retaking what is his. And fuck, that is so nice. Like, if we could truly put our pride away and really think in these terms and like understand our our connection to each other as people, as humans, as all of us just trying to understand and grow together, that is just a beautiful sentiment. The episode continues with John returning to the village and seeing just how quickly life can be taken away. He is relieved to know that Fuji is okay and then goes to the garden and stands up the stone that the gardener placed and told him had meaning, making this place more than just a pile of rocks. It is an emotional moment that came out of nowhere. So much love for this episode. Like five out of five, this was my favorite episode. Even this tiny little moment that they share together is helping John understand how these things have meaning and all lead to the grand story that is is the important thing. But we then see Omi and Yabushigi going over the documents that proved that the gardener was a spy and that he had died already. It was a convenient death, and it was a great way to further show that his life had more meaning for the greater good and for the story that would help Toradaga in, in the very end. But then we come to the final scene. Oh my goodness. Ochiba returns home looking at her son like a monster ready to devour its head. Like, I don't know, this is a creepy, interesting look. And then it shows her chatting with uh, Lord Ishido. She says that Toranaga has once again paralyzed the council and outmaneuvered them entirely. It's rather like blunt language, and it seems like the mother of the heir is not down for Toranaga's cause, which may be true, or this could be a mask, but these looks from the flashback in episode two still need to be explained. And I'm, I, I really feel like she is on Toranaga's side, but maybe not. I could be wrong here. Lord Ishido tries to assure her that he will take care of everything. And she interrupts. She demands that it's time to stop the politics and the council will now answer to her. I think this is meant as that she is going to be the fifth regent, though it's not exactly clear. It is lit in such a creepy way, like her face, everything here. She is a phantom spirit with power beyond our understanding, and it is brilliant. It is a great way to end this episode and show just how powerful she is. We don't really know why she's so powerful or coming off as like this, this menacing, and I cannot wait to see what her true power is. I really do feel like it relates to Swarnaga in some kind of way. I feel like it relates to the Amida assassins in, in probably the most direct way, but ultimately with that we come to the end of the episode thank you so much for watching please be sure to hit that like button comment your favorite emoji obliterate the subscribe button and special thank you to everyone over on patreon find the links for that and my twitch live streams and twitter outtakes and many more things in the description below much love everybody and i cannot wait to talk to you all again soon